Okay, great. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Welcome to the introduction to Rubin Observatory session where we're going to cover all kinds of basics about Rubin Observatory. Um, jargon, acronyms, basic info, all that kind of stuff. And just before we get started, um, I want to point out that on the plenary session webpage for the construction plenary that happened this morning, there's a pre-recorded video from uh, Steve Kahn and he goes into a lot of the details and sort of gives a whole observatory overview. So that's another good resource that um, we don't currently have linked to the this session's web page, but um, it's also a, a good, it's also a good pre-recorded video resource to watch. So um, today uh, myself and Jim Annis uh, are going to be hosting this session. And we are going to have a bunch of speakers from the different observatory systems here also to sort of give you an overview. Um, you are free to post questions in the Zoom chat and also in the Slack channel for this uh, session. And when you do, remember that when you registered for the Project and Community Workshop, um, you signed a code of conduct and so this slide is to remind you that you signed it and that any discriminatory behavior against colleagues on any basis will not be tolerated and also that if you witness or experience any bullying harassment or aggression um, there is a reporting process for that and you can find it by going to the main project and community workshop webpage and clicking on the resources menu option and you will find your way to the code of conduct and to our our individuals who you report to um, as you can see on this slide right there and Jim's going to tell you about interaction let me introduce myself. I'm Jim Annis. I'm relatively new to the Rubin Observatory. I'm part of the pre-ops team. I'm from Fermilab and from the um, Cosmology Surveys group there. And I've been in other experiments before this one, the SDSS, the DES, and now DESK and LSST and Rubin. And joining any big collaboration, any big project, is a process that takes a long time and what we're doing here is trying to help you along in the process of becoming functional and happy and productive LSST scientists that includes how you interact with other people and I've just been fascinated to watch the seismic waves that came from the Black Lives Matter project protests as they roll through the different collaborations I'm involved with including this one I'm looking really looking forward to Friday's session. So we have a standard virtual workshop. I'm sure it's going to be our future as well as the present. We have tools, Slack and Zoom. We're going to use them. Um, the videos are being, we're, we're taking these videos. You could, you're more than welcome to opt out of the videos by turning off your microphone and your camera. There has been people saying that the better way to do interactions by having your cameras on. I actually believe that you get to see other people and gallery view is great. There's ways of um, get, providing feedback during these Zoom virtual meetings, some Slack questions um, and, and the Zoom emoticons. The Zoom things mostly are in the Slack or in the bottom in the reactions, sometimes in the participants list. Slack, just go over there and talk. We'll have a little more um, discussion of how to do, we're going, we're going to organize the conversations in this meeting in a couple of slides. Um, but just as one more uh, orientation, all these presentations are available on the agenda page and looking at them offline is really useful. Next slide. Next slide, yes. Now, so this is an agenda of what we're going to be doing today. And uh, like Jim just introduced himself, uh, I didn't. My name is Melissa Graham. I work for Rubin Observatory at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I work for the data management team primarily as a science analyst. And my science backgrounds are uh, mostly supernovae, but sometimes I work on uh, photometric redshifts as well. And we've got a session today that's going to do an overview of the project and the 
and this workshop, how this workshop works. And we're going to hear from lots of different people, all of whom will introduce themselves um, when their slide decks come up. And we're going to hear from a variety of the Rubin Observatory systems, a little bit about onboarding in case there's any new Rubin Project staff uh, in our audience, and then a little bit about the science collaborations for anyone who might be new to the science community. So let's get started. Um, Jim's going to tell us a little bit more, I think, about how to interact on Zoom chat and the Slack channel. Yeah, let's try this idea of how to communicate. Let's use the Zoom chat as a way to ask formal questions. And this Slack is a place to have a conversation about what you're hearing. I find conversations about talks during the talks work really well. Um, we'll have people moderating the Slack channel, which means to us looking at it and seeing if there's a good question that needs to be asked to the speakers. When that happens, a moderator will ask you to unmute and you can ask your question in person. So let's go over that again. Formal questions in the Zoom chat and conversation. Let's have that in Slack. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to start um, with a set of slides from Rand Paul Gill. Rand Paul, would you like to unmute and speak to your slides? Yes. So thanks for inviting me uh, to speak here, Melissa and Jim. Um, I'm seeing that there are, is it 113 people on? I'm just comparing that to when we did this talk last year, when there were nowhere near as many as that many people in the room. So in case you don't know me, my name is Rampal Gill, and I'm head of communications at the Rubin Observatory. And I can't see my slides right now, so give me a sec. Okay, right. So you, you heard in the plenary this morning from Steve that, uh, you know, we've been renamed the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, and that happened in December of 2019, um, and officially the release happened, uh, I mean, the press release and everything happened in January at the AAAS. So we are now officially the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Uh, the survey is called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. So we do still get to keep our beloved acronym LSST, which is very important to many of us. And the telescope is called the Simone Survey Telescope, which is fulfilling our promise to Simone, who gave us 20 million in the very early days to get uh, this project off the ground. We do not use the acronym VRO. Let me stress that again. I know Steve did stress it this morning, but we really want to get away from using the acronym because it doesn't give Vera Rubin herself enough of the limelight. And we are the first national US observatory to be named after a woman. And we want to celebrate that. So we want the name Rubin to be repeated as many times as we can. Uh, you might say, oh, you know, Vera C. Rubin Observatory is quite a long name. It is, and that's why it's okay to just say Rubin. It's as quick as saying the acronym, if not quicker. I've put a link here on, the, on this slide to our naming guidelines in case you have any questions, you know, with all these different names that I've just told you about, you can always contact us for clarification. On the next slide. Let's see. So when you first join a project, you're bombarded with acronyms and names and a whole new kind of vocabulary that you're trying to get your head around. Well, this glossary is there to help you with that. So the URL is, is here on this page, on this slide, and it's a really good tool. You can just type in a few letters and it will bring up the contents of um, that match what you've typed in. If you find that there's something missing, please reach out and let us know because we want to make this better. We want to make it a useful tool for everyone. On the next slide, this is the main website. It's still called lsst.org. The URL will get updated for operations to a more Rubin uh, type of uh, URL, but for now, during the rest of the duration of the construction project, the URL won't change. And the link shown here is, is within the science uh, scientist area, and there's just, just a wealth of information there for you as the community to get up to speed and to you know, hunt around to see if, if you can find the information that you're looking for. There's just a lot of information there. It is hard for us to try and keep this updated. You might see some out of date information. We really do try, but we don't always succeed. 
On the next slide then, uh, we use a number of channels to keep in touch with, uh, with the community, with the general public. <clears throat> So what you see here is a list of social media channels, but what I really want to do is call out three specific areas. And there's one is the email. You can always get in touch with the communications team through this email address. Secondly, you can subscribe to our digest. Now that goes out approximately every two weeks and it has a lot of information in there that's current and relevant, things that have happened, things that are going to happen in the future. And that's a really a good piece of information for you to have that comes into your inbox. You can read it whenever you have some time. And then finally, there's the community forum. And this is a, a place that you can look to see whether your question has been answered, if you have a question. And if it hasn't, then ask your question and you will get a kind of crowdsource type of answer to what you might be just uh, thinking that, you know, why hasn't anybody else asked this? And then that information is like a resource. It's like a knowledge base. It's there for anyone else in the future to look, to look at and to, to find answers to their questions. I'll end here just by letting you know that the communications team is made up of four people and we work together. We work together on a multitude of projects, including things like this meeting and media inquiries and just a whole plethora of many other things. And we're always happy to help you with anything that you might have. So if you uh, don't know who to contact to get an answer to your question, contact us. We'll navigate. It will help you navigate the system and, and get to the right person to ask your question. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ren Paul. Um, we just have one more slide and then we have a scheduled pause for, um, for questions. And that is this slide that tells you all about the project and community workshop. Um, so the, the, the Rubin project and community workshop is really orchestrated by the attendees. Um, usually they're the ones who suggest what breakout sessions there should be. And then um, attendees are assigned session chairs for the breakouts. And then they're completely responsible for filling those breakout sessions with contents. Um, in addition to breakouts, this virtual project and community workshop this year includes a bunch of project plenaries, like the construction one that you just attended, where um, Mondays and Tuesdays are both being done with pre-recorded videos and then live Q&As. On Thursday, we're going to have a science keynote um, speaker. Um, and then also, there's a very special session on Tuesday morning. It's right after the operations plenary that's called Rubin Research Bites. And this is the first time where we've tried to collect just open contributions for small flash talks, arrange them by topic. And so you'll be able to go to two of those. Just check out the session webpage for the Rubin Research Bites. Um, Tuesday and Wednesday morning, there's going to be lightning stories, which are like fun little staff profiles where you get to know, you can get to know people who work for Rubin. And then on Friday, <clears throat> the very last session of the PCW is always a big breakout summary session where one representative from each of the breakouts presents a single slide about what was done um, during that breakout. So you get at least a little taste of all the sessions that you um, couldn't attend. When we do face-to-face -face meetings, um, as we usually do, we also usually have a lot of project technical sessions. But this is really a project and community workshop. This year, the virtual version is more focused on just community breakout sessions, science sessions, but usually when we're face-to-face, -face, all the project staff also have their team meetings and technical meetings. We sometimes also have embedded workshops, um, such as one on deblending that was two years ago that ran at the same time as a project and community workshop. We also like to have um, student poster sessions, unconferences, soccer and board games, and a public talk when we're um, in face-to-face -face times. So that's just to kind of give you an idea of uh, what the PCW is usually like and what this year's uh, is featuring. Um, and especially with the virtual format, there's the opportunity to make a lot of um, content available uh, sort of on demand. So you can look at slide decks in advance, you can watch pre-recorded videos, and we've let you know which of the sessions have prepared preview materials by tagging them in the agenda on the web page. So if you go to the agenda that's in the PCW website and just sort of scroll through, wherever you see that little red text that says preview materials, that means something has been prepared for you uh, in advance that you can go and look at. 
And I just want to bring up three other sessions that um, people new to Ruben might uh, also benefit from. One of them is right after this session. It's community support for science. Um, so that you might be interested in. And then the two are things I already mentioned. The Ruben Research Bites, Contributed Flash Talks, and the Breakout Summaries. It's going to be on Friday. So here, let's pause for questions. First from the Zoom chat and then from our Slack channel. So I have the Zoom chat open right here. So I can see there's a question for Rand Paul about whether the four people on your comms teams, whether they're full time. Oh, and I see you answered it. Um, so that one is already answered. That's great. And another question for Rand Paul from the Slack channel on whether the new website you mentioned will be integrated with the Noir Lab webpage. That is all kind of work in progress at the moment. Um, it, is, it is my understanding that the individual programs will have their own website that has like the bulk of the information on it and that the Noir Lab uh, website would be like a conduit to, to get people to the right programs website. Um, but it's all pretty much work in progress and we will know, I guess, how it turns out in the end. Okay, cool. I can see that some people are typing in the Slack. Um, so we have another question. How do science working groups interact with LSST? That is a very good question. And the last section of this um, meeting is going to be all about the science collaboration. So I think I'm going to leave that question until later. And the, the coordinator of the science collaborations will also be joining us later. So that's a perfect question for, for her. Um, going to pause, have an awkward silence, in case anyone has more questions about communications. Okay, in that case, let's get started with um, the representatives of the four main Rubin Observatory systems are going to each give a little presentation. We're going to start with Sandrine. So Sandrine, if you'd like to unmute, introduce yourself and speak to your slides. Okay, thank you, Melissa. So yes, my name is Sandrine Thomas. I'm uh, part of the Telescope, Sci Telescope Insight group as part of the um, Telescope Insight scientists. So my responsibilities are really to ensure that we're actually building the telescope and infrastructure that will lead to the science that we want to achieve. So what is Telescope Insight? So it, it actually encompasses the structures located both at the summit and at the base. And when I say structures, it actually contains both the main telescope that you see on the picture on the bottom left and the auxiliary telescope, which you see on the same picture, but more to the right. And our goal is to acquire, calibrate, and schedule the survey. Um, the main telescope it has a um, very stiff telescope mount assembly that is very compact, and that allows for a very fast motion. You will probably hear in a few of the talks that we actually have um, a 30 second exposure, total sec uh, 30, two times 30, uh, 15 seconds, that leads to 30 second exposure. But we need to get there in a, every single position in the sky in about five seconds. So that means that the telescope needs to arrive at the position in three seconds and get ready to observe. So that's why it's very compact and stiff. We also have a dome that is following the TMA to ensure that it is at the right location when we need to get to the right field. And to observe, we have um, three mirrors. So we have a three mirror system, and one M3, you're gonna hear that term uh, many times. So this is because we have the M1 and the M3 mirrors in the same monolithic piece of glass. And then the M2 mirror and the two examples. I will go in, uh, in a little bit more detail in the next slide. To control all everything, we have a full control software, including uh, a few different systems. So I, I actually put the three that you might hear the most during those, those few days. The SAL, which is a su service abstraction layer, and that allows us to communicate and to send the, um, the commands through to each elements. 
these elements are called CSCs, controllable style components. So these are pieces of software that actually control each uh, hardware. So for example, the M1, M3, the M2, the TMX, etc. And then finally, we have a scheduler, which is the brain of the observatory. The scheduler is the piece of software that allows us to decide where to go next in the sky um, at, each, at each of the, the observation. And then finally, we have a calibration system that, as I mentioned, has an auxiliary telescope and also an in-dome calibration, uh, which is a regular calibration that you do when you want to take flat fields, etc. And then the last bullet I have on that, uh, on that page are for maintenance purposes mostly. Uh, we have an 80 ton vertical platform lift. I don't know if Melissa can show it, but it's on the cartoon on the right, which is the lift that actually goes from the telescope, which is on the left to the bottom uh, level. And that actually allows us to move the M1, M3, for example, when it needs to be recorded because that's where at the bottom, that's where the cooling plant, which has all the material that is necessary to re-illuminate the mirrors is, and it's huge. I'll, I'll try to show you in the next slide. Uh, so next slide. And because I don't have a lot of time, I, I kind of wanted to uh, focus on the core of what Telescope Inside do and the imaging system. Uh, I mentioned already, it has three mirrors and you have the diameters on the slide, 8.4, 3.5, and 5. And it was designed to accommodate in 3.5 degree field of view, which is really large. And um, this, the, it has a particular design that allows us to get a good image quality over that big of a field of view. It is compact. Um, and all of the mirrors have a lot of actuators to uh, further increase the image quality of the system. And that active optic system that we call, so the active optic system is really what you do to improve the image quality. It, the actuators are actually on the, um, are pushing in some ways on the surface of the mirrors to deform the mirror to actually adjust for any errors that you have in the system. And we have uh, these to compensate for gravity. As you turn the mirror, you have a lot of weight that actually make those uh, mirror look like potato chips. So we have to compensate for that. And we also have uh, wavefront sensors on the camera. And you'll see that in the next few slides, I think from the camera team to correct for any other uh, residual that is in the system. And on the right of this diagram, you see on the top, the M2 mirror being uh, that was just after it was being um, coded. And that happened last year. And I like this picture, so I put it there. And on the bottom is really your response, uh, the throughput as a function of wavelength. And then next slide, and it's just a second slide because I really wanted to show the status. Uh, this is what we call the level three at the observatory which is the maintenance floor. And uh, it actually shows you the status of every, uh, most of the systems before the shutdown with the M2 in the back left, the exapod rotator attached to the integrate in what we call the integrating structure with the camera cable wrap just in front of M2. And then on the right, you have the cell, the M1, M3 cell with the M1, M3 surrogate, and just you see the bottom of it on the back is the coding uh, chamber. So this has a lot of elements that were being tested um, and hopefully sometime soon being put on the telescope mount. So that's really what I have to say. If you have any question, please ask me. Three minutes is not a long time, so I might have rushed to some of the terminology. So let me, um, yeah, let me offer my contribution by saying yes. Uh, send me any questions if you have any. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andrew. We're going to pause after the four STEM systems for questions, but also Zoom chat and Slack chat at any time. Um, you can ask Sandrine your questions about that right now. Um, and to follow up on Telescope and Sight, um, our next speaker, this is such a great picture. I don't want to leave the slide, but um, our next speaker is um, Robert is going to tell us uh, 
Give us an overview of camera. Robert, you ready to unmute? Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, yes, my name is Robert DePeister. Uh, for the past several years, I've had I've, I've been involved with the camera construction project. <clears throat> and today I'm going to give you a quick overview of the observatory camera. There's limited time, so I'm going to dive right into it. It is the world's largest digital camera. <clears throat> it has a, a focal plane of about three gigapixels. And currently it is being assembled at SLAC at Menlo Park, California. The, uh, if you look at the lower right hand picture, it will show you camera size. <clears throat> at the front, the camera is about 1.6 meters in diameter. And front to back, it runs about three meters. It is about 2,500 uh, kilograms. It weighs about 2,500 kilograms, which is about 2.8 tons. The camera has two main sections, a front section called the camera body, which contains the imaging components and a back section called the utility trunk, which provides utilities to the camera body, such as uh, refrigeration and electrical power. Now let's look at the exploded view. The light enters the camera at the lower left through the L1, L2 lens assembly. It then reaches the camera filter, assuming the filter's online, the filter changing mechanism can raise and lower a filter uh, between the uh, online position and uh, to, a, to a storage position on the filter carousel. The uh, light then passes through the shutter and enters the enters the uh, the cryostat. The cryostat is the cryogenic container or chamber that contains the focal plane. The focal plane itself is made up of charge coupled device type sensors or CCDs that are attached to the basis of mechanical assemblies called rafts. So the focal plane is made up of sensors attached to the bottom surface of rafts. Once the light uh, strikes the focal plane, it, uh, the, the energy from the photons is converted to electrical signals by raft electronics. The electrical signals are passed to the back of the cryostat <clears throat> where they're converted to optical signals. And the, the, the signals contain imaging data from the, the uh, read out from the focal plane. The optical signals are, uh, well, the data is, is uh, pre-processed and stored where it's, they're available for the data management system downstream from the camera. The exploded view also shows there are two types of rafts. If you look uh, just to the left of the cryostat, above the cryostat, you see that there are corner rafts and science rafts. Science rafts are responsible for the camera imaging. They take the camera images and corner rafts are responsible for inputting information to the telescope control system for actions such as locating guide stars and as Sandrine mentioned, also correcting for uh, wavefront variations in incoming light. So, okay, yeah, now we're looking at the second slide. Oh, one other thing I wanted to point out is that the rafts are actually, thank you, the rafts are actually installed in a grid within the cryostat. The grid maintains very accurate separation between the rafts and, and in so doing make, maintains accurate alignment of the sensor surfaces on the basis of the, the rafts. And that makes for a, a really tightly integrated focal plane, which is extremely flat. Now this slide real quick, the graphic at left shows, it's a representation of the focal plane grid. The large square there represents a position of a science raft or more correctly, the, the sensors on a science raft. There are nine CCDs or sensors on a science raft uh, in a three by three matrix. Each CCD is a 4K by 4K matrix of pixels and pixel size is 10 microns. Uh, there are 21 science rafts in the grid and four corner rafts. The corner rafts are arranged around the circumference. I believe the, the sketch points that out. Uh, 
The rest of the sketch is to indicate that CCD readout is optimized so that readout of the entire focal plane can be, can be fast. Uh, the way the readout is optimized, uh, it's segmented and the segments are read in parallel. So the entire focal plane can be read in about two seconds. It supports uh, a, uh, 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 it supports the 3.5 field of view of the camera and the focal plane is cooled at minus 100 degrees to keep the sensors happy. So that's the basic overview. Of course, there's a lot more information about the camera and in particular about optics and imaging for the camera. Uh, but that's for another time, another day. So I hope this overview was helpful and thanks for your attention. Awesome, thanks Robert. Um, if there's any questions about camera, we're gonna pause in a little bit, but I can see um, Q and A is going on in the Zoom chat now about telescopes. So if you do have questions about camera, you can post them in the chat or in the Slack channel and get answers sort of as we move along. Um, so kind of continuing in our observatory systems, telescope in sight, camera, camera makes the data, and then what do we do with the data? So I'm going to talk a bit about data management. This is sort of a one slide overview of all of data management's data products and services, sort of starting from the left, um, starting with the raw data, of course, the sequential 30 second images that cover the entire visible sky every few days. I think one of the most important things to know about the data processing and the data products is that they're really divided into two basic types. One of them is the prompt data products, and then the other is the data release data products. So the prompt data products, this is what's happening sort of in real time on a nightly or a daily uh, time scale. And all of this analysis, um, all of these data products are based on difference image analysis, which you will always hear shortened as DIA. So it's where you have one new image and you subtract off an older image to make a difference image. You do your detection and your source detection and your difference image. So the results of this DIA that happens in real time during the night is often um, alerts, which we'll talk more about in a moment, which come out in 60 seconds, or the sources and objects from the difference images, the difference images themselves and the original and then like the science images themselves, which um, come out in 24 hours. Compare this with the data release data products, which is a full reprocessing, so redoing difference image analysis on all of the data um, to date every year, and then also making deeply stacked coads and doing source and object detections on the coads um, and releasing all of those data products um, on a yearly on a yearly basis. So you have those two different types of data products, prompt and data release. You have the different time scales for them, daily and yearly. And then you also have different access methods for them. And in particular the alerts um, go out in a nightly stream and users would access them through community brokers, which we'll talk about more on the next slide. Whereas for um, the prompt products database and also the data releases will be accessed through the data access centers, which are often shortened to DEC. That's an, an acronym, the acronym DEC. And in particular, users will use the Rubin Science Platform, which is like the set of software that users use for next to the data analysis of the LSST data products with the data management science pipelines and tools or custom built tools like Jupyter Notebooks that you might write to interact with the data. So that science platform is at the deck. I want to point out that there's a, um, a single document that describes all the data products and it's called the data products definitions document, which you will hear shortened to DPDD all the time we reference the DPDD and there's a link to it right there um, that you can go and, and look at. Um, so yes, so it's like the key terms regarding uh, data management are all here on this slide. I think we covered them all. And now I just want to sort of dive in a little bit more to each of these types of data products and pull out some pieces of jargon that you might hear this week. So the first, the prompt processing that we just talked about, the DIA that happens, the difference image analysis that happens in real time. Um, 
you have a difference image and you detect sources on that difference image and we call those DIA sources. That's a single source detected on a single difference image. You might also hear the term DIA object. That's the collection of all DIA sources that are at a given sky coordinate. You'll also hear the term alert. That's basically just an ASCII file of data about a particular DIA source and that alert is released within 60 seconds of that image being taken. So the image gets taken, difference image analysis happens, the DIA source is detected, an alert is made with all the data about that DIA source and it goes out and it goes out to a broker. And brokers are software systems that receive and process alerts and that's what users will use. You can have an account with the broker, you can search the alerts, so you can set up filters um, so that only um, certain alerts that meet your requirements like in magnitude or sky location um, show up on your list. So those are some terms there. And then there's also the term SS object, the solar system object, which is like a DIA object, except for a moving, for a moving object. And I want to point out that a lot of the details about SS objects, solar system objects, are also in the DPDD. And in a data management tech note at DMTN 087, which I've linked in the bottom corner of this slide. You might also hear the prompt products database, um, shortened to PPDB during uh, the project and community workshop. And that's the, the basically the catalogs um, from which alerts are made. So the catalogs of DIA sources and DIA objects. So that's prompt processing jargon. Let's move on to data release uh, processing jargon. You'll often hear the term data release shortened to just DR. So DR1 refers to the first half year of data that is processed, packaged up, and then released. So there'll be 11 data releases in total. Um, sorry, that should go from DR1 to DR11, where the 11th one is at the 10th year, after, um, after year 10. In terms of data release data products, you will hear the term standard visit, um, and that refers to a single 30 second image on the sky. You'll hear the term CalExp, which is a calibrated exposure, which means it's the processed version of that standard, um, that standard visit or single visit. A co-ad, on the other hand, is a deep stack of all of the visits, and those co-ads get deeper um, with every year of the data release. And of course, co-ads, we're making a giant map of the sky well, with LSST, but you need some sort of functional way to break that down and access the data. So you'll hear the terms tracked and patch referred to um, when people are talking about the, the co-added stack of the, the basically the all sky image and the tract is sort of like a large area a large chunk of the all sky co-add and then the patch is a smaller region of the tract and so later when you're sort of searching or you want to pull out chunks of a co-add in order to run your analysis on them or something like that you're going to be dealing with patches of tracts later um, like DIA source and DIA object, the terms source and object refer to a single detection in a single image and a collection of all sources that are at a given sky coordinate. And we also have the term force source. So DIA source and source are detections. That means they're detected at um, five sigma uh, or, or greater. Um, but you also want to get photometry at the location where you know there is or was an object even when it's not detected um, at five sigma. So we call that forced source. So there'll be catalogs also of forced sources and that just means forced photometry um, on, on, single, on, on, on single, single images. Um, so aside from prompt and data release data products, we also refer to user generated data products. These are reprocessed images or catalogs using the, the data management science pipelines or custom pipelines that any science users might create. These can be generated, stored, and shared via the science platform. Uh, but I just want to point out that like all Rubin data products, they are also subjected to the data rights policies. And I've put a link to that um, here on this slide as well. So hopefully that busts some of the jargon that you might encounter um, at the PCW with, with, ref, with reference to, um, to data management. Um, and definitely let me know if you have any uh, questions in the, in the chat or in the Slack. So 
I think several that, questions, but I think we're running very late. So I think we should hold them off till later. Yeah, we have, um, yeah, we might, we might not have, to, have time for any live questions today. I think we'll run through the rest of the slides and then, and then see. Um, I did not time myself, which is probably a bad idea. Um, but next I want to invite Lauren to speak a bit to BPO. Hi, yeah, um, my name is Lauren Corlees. I'm an anonymer on the education team and also deputy head. Um, and so we're sort of the, we're a full subsystem in the project and like the sort of the last piece of the flow of information. So if the telescope and camera data, data management is processing it, processing it so the scientists can use it and uh, do their science. We're then here to promote awareness of the observatory and to really try and take all the discoveries that are going to come out of it and share it with the rest of the world. Um, and so our mission is to offer accessible and engaging online experiences that provide non-specialists -special access to and context for LSST data um, so that anyone can explore the universe and be part of the discovery process. And so we're really emphasizing things like data and context so that any person can go and interact with the data that we're taking and have a sense of why it's important and why it's exciting. Um, and which for me is the best part about EPO is trying to get people engaged in what we're doing. Um, one thing that we've produced this year that goes towards that direction is uh, the video that I'm linking to here. It's a promotional video for the observatory, which is quite fun to watch if you're interested. Um, and in general, we have um, fewer uh, acronyms for things, um, but we're definitely very large in scope. And so I wanted to take a few seconds to talk about the things that we're building in construction that will enable us to do outreach um, as the observatory moves into operations. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so sharing Rubin Observatory Science with the world is kind of a, a big mission. And so we break that down into a few sets of groups that in particular we're targeting as we build materials in this construction phase. Um, so we're thinking about formal education in classrooms and how can we help teachers bring astronomy and real data into their classrooms in ways that feel intuitive but also real to the exploration of science. And so we're building eight classroom investigations that work towards that goal. Um, Ram Pal mentioned that we're going to have a new website in operations and EPO is building that as a primary way to reach the general public to communicate science discoveries. And we're also building something that we're calling the sky viewer, which is just an all sky viewer. So people can go and actually explore the images that the telescope is going to be taking. We're also working on building infrastructure to do citizen science projects. So we're going to be taking so much data as the observatory that it's almost impossible for the science community alone to really analyze all of the data. Um, and so we're expecting people to want to engage the broader world in helping them analyze the data. So we're building infrastructure to help with that. Um, and we're also um, providing a multimedia gallery. So things like the video that I linked to on the first slide, other graphics, planetarium videos, for anyone who wants to communicate about Rubin Observatory, they can have some, some graphics and things to enable them to do that. Um, next slide. Hopefully this will play. So I just wanted to demo what I mean by an interactive data experience. Um, so these, these kinds of tools are is what my team has been working on building for the past year. So what you can see is we've taken a light curve, we've given people a template, and now we're building in interactions that are just in their browser. So you don't need to download anything. There's no software, there's no data to download. It's all just, you open a website and you get this experience where you can drag and drop templates, you can fit curves, you can try and identify what are the numerical values coming out of the curves. And so you're sort of removing all of the technical aspects of that and really just leading people to this intuitive exploration of the data. Um, and so if that brief video looked cool, um, we built a whole suite of these kinds of what we're calling widgets. Um, and you can come and check out our EPO session on Thursday at 12 p.m. Pacific or 3 p.m. Eastern. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Lauren. Um, okay, here, I'd like to maybe pause for just one minute if we have any questions about the subsystem that haven't yet been answered in um, the Zoom chat or the Slack chat. While we're waiting for a question, I might have a comment that I forgot to mention at the end of my last slide. 
Uh, and that was about the whole integration activity that are coming up and uh, are happening. And uh, the one term I mentioned to, I didn't mention is sitcom. And really right now, because we're entering this, this uh, integration and commissioning activity, this, is a great, this was a great opportunity to say that we're really working all of us as a same team, which is called the system integration and commissioning team to uh, characterize the, uh, um, the, the system and the observatory uh, as a whole. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. I'm just going to say too, there's one question here about downloading all of the data release light curves and will, will it be possible to do so? And I just want to answer that question live. It's definitely going to be possible to download some data, but there will be caps and quotas on the amount of data that you can download from the science platform just because there's so much of it. Um, so I don't think it will be possible to like just download all, maybe like of the ones that you're interested in, if that's a small enough amount, and it will be made clear later where the, the caps on download size are. And th then there will be like um, other ways to get at all of the data should you need it. So um, um, hopefully that kind of answers your question a little bit there, Constantine. And okay, I think the other ones can Melissa. be answered. Yes. Quickly, I just wanted to answer the Zoom question, Chuck, because I think it's an important thing I forgot to emphasize, which is essentially asking, are the materials that I'm talking about available for anyone or only Americans? Um, so our defined audiences are the US and Chile. Um, but so that means most things that we're producing will be in both English and Spanish. Um, and the website, for example, is publicly available and the um, education materials in the citizen science will also be either available or, on our website or on the Zooniverse. So they'll primarily be in English and Spanish, but anyone would have access to them. Thanks. Excellent. Okay. Thanks to all our speakers there and also for people asking questions in the chat. Um, let's invite Jim to unmute and welcome any new Ruben project staff who might be here. Yes. Hope that people are still being hired for Ruben. Uh, I'm relatively new. I have a whole bunch of friends who are relatively new. I'm sure Ruben will be hiring for the next decade, given its scope and the size of the operation. It's a daunting thing because it's an entire world. We can give you some pointers on how to get moving. Um, there's a new staff onboarding process menu available at that first link, projectlcd.org onboarding. Um, fill it out. It starts the process, but it is a process, not an event. The next thing to do is probably go to the data management page. It's mostly for the data management staff, but it's full of all kinds of useful information. And you probably should spend an hour on it, looking around, trying to figure out all the different things that are available to you. That screenshot on the right is, uh, is from that page. Um, mostly what you're trying to do is to get connected to all the different communication channels that the Ruben Observatory uses. Um, that can be GitHub and Slack. It's also Confluence and Jira, and also project.lc.org, all of which talk to each other and talk to different parts of the staff and the project. None of this is the science experiments. I'm involved in DESK really heavily. They have their own systems for communication. Um, the other science collaborations I'm not so much involved with. Um, but this will be a start. And you know, it's the staff that makes the observatory possible, that makes the data reduction happen, that allows one to use the science platform to do all the science that you want to do. So welcome to the team, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Yes, and welcome all our new project staff. And that kind of segues nicely into the next section, which is all about the Ruben Science Collaborations. I'm gonna invite Fed to unmute. And Fed, if you would like to share your own slides instead of having me share, I can stop sharing. That would be great. At least let me give it a try. I didn't think about the fact that animations don't work so well when somebody else is presenting their slides. Do you see my slides? Um, yes. 
Okay. Yeah. And you should be, we should be on the project staff slide. So, um, hi, um, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Federica Bianco. I am the Science Collaborations Coordinator for the Rubin LSST Science Collaborations, as well as the co-chair of one of the science collaborations, the Transient and Variable Stars Science Collaboration. Let me see if I can remove this. So to put the science collaboration in context, I want to emphasize two critical aspects of Rubin. Um, one is the fact that Rubin will really produce a transformational volume of data, uh, 10 times as much data as even the most um, data product productive surveys that we had today. So in this slide, you see, um, you know, against the, the scope of this, uh, of this talk, you do see a lot of algorithms, uh, a lot of acronyms. These are just names of precursor surveys to Rubin and to the LSST. And you see the data volume that these surveys are producing. And even the most ambition, ambitious one, DES, the Dark Energy Survey, produces about 10 times less data than the Rubin LSST will per night. 20 terabytes of data every night for 10 years. And then a second aspect that is transformational about uh, the Rubin LSST is that these data comes in, in images that are really extremely high quality. So on the right hand side of the screen here, you see um, an image from the SDSS, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, which was one of the first, probably the first um, sur synoptic survey in the spirit of uh, Rubin and the ES and, and PTF, et cetera. Um, and now you're gonna see that same image of the sky as in an HSC, uh, Hyper Supreme Cam image, which is a, a similar quality to the, um, the images that Rubin will produce. Uh, and I want to emphasize that at this image quality, at this image resolution, at this image depth, everything that you see is blended and everything that you see is variable in time. So really this requires transformational algorithms and methods to analyze the images. You cannot just simply scale prior methods and prior ways to do reduce the data to produce science from the data. Lastly, let me point out one more time that one very peculiar thing about the Rubin LSST is that it's not a survey that is designed to do one thing with some piggyback science that also gets produced in that context. It's really a survey that is designed to do everything that is possible with exquisite image quality, uh, significant depth, and high time resolution. It will do things that range from solar system to the most distance explosion, 20 order of magnitudes in distance, since the 60 order of magnitudes in energy scales will be explored. Particularly, there are four science themes for the Rubin LSST, um, for the Rubin LSST goals. Uh, understand the nature of dark energy and dark matter, producing an unprecedented inventory of solar system objects from near Earth asteroids, including killer asteroids, to the outer solar system objects that elude most surveys, Understand the structure of the Milky Way by a results sterile population with a collection of 17 billion stars that will be characterized in, in color, magnitude, and variability. And closest to my heart, because this is my domain of science, exploring the transient and variable universe. Keep in mind these symbols for a second for each one of these four science goals. Um, and then let me finally get to the science collaboration. Uh, because the Rubin LSST data belongs to the people, there is no science team, no team that is supported by the NSF and DOE funds within Rubin to exploit the data and turn them into science. The LSST data really does belong to the people and the people have the responsibility to produce science from it. So the people have organized in eight science collaboration, their self-managed teams, uh, Active Galactic Nuclei, AGN, Desk, Dark Energy Science Collaboration, Galaxy Science Collaborations, ISSC, which stands for Informatic and Statistics Science Collaboration. This one is a long one. SMWLV, Stars Milky Way and Local Volume Science Collaborations. SLLC, Strong Lensing Science Collaboration. SSSC, Solar System Science Collaboration. And finally, TVS the Transients and Variable Star Science Collaboration. So you will hear these acronyms probably dropped into talks quite frequently, um, and this is what they mean. 
Now, keeping in mind both sets of symbols, obviously there are some, some direct correspondence between, there is some direct correspondence between some of the science collaborations and some of the science goals. Transients and variable stars, TVS domain, DES, that's dark energy, SML, MWLV studies the galaxy and SSST studies the solar system. However, there are more than those science collaborations. And if you think about it, a lot of the science collaboration really are invested in more than one of the science goals. This produces a very interactive environment between the scientists that populate the science collaboration. Each science collaboration ranges inside from a few tens to a few hundreds. Here you see um, the, the core members of the science collaboration listed and generally this uh, paler blue indicates the growth over time in the size of the science collaboration over the past couple of years. I want to emphasize that DESC, the Dark Energy Science Collaboration, is in fact a lot larger because it allows members to participate on an associate basis, so be loosely connected. And if you put together all the members that are loosely connected to DESC, uh, you reach almost a thousand. Altogether, there are about 1,500 people in the science collaborations. They're represented in five continents. Um, here you have a heat map that shows the representation by state in the United States and uh, by country around the world. Uh, I'll get back to that, to the international participation in a second. Um, so what do we do? Primarily, our goal is to prepare for doing science with the Rubin LSST data. This includes training and support. We organized uh, over the years a very large number of meetings of individual science collaborations um, and also meetings of more than one science collaboration to talk about cross uh, topics and to learn from each other experience. We just now, for example, organized on Thursday and Friday last week, a hackathon to study the metrics, the ways in which we can evaluate simulations of the Rubin strategy, which was a cross science collaboration topic. Uh, their nursery for Rubin, Rubin uh, software. A lot of the software that you hear, uh, that you will hear at this meeting that is being talked about is um, that is not written by Rubin Observatory itself, is written by scientists that are inside of science collaborations and that leverage the environment of the science collaboration to understand um, how to best implement this software. For example, you will hear the brokers. Uh, these are dispatcher that deliver the alerts that Melissa talked about to the community. That is a piece of software that, that was created by members of science collaborations and leveraged the other members of the science collaborations to understand how to best create this. Um, we also have organized uh, challenges, the Kaggle challenge you may have heard of, the plastic challenge, which was a Kaggle, challenge, Kaggle data challenge, so public platforms where we can engage people outside of the science collaboration uh, and outside of astronomy, just the general public that, or the general scientific public um, to explore solutions for problems um, that will arise in the LSST data analysis. This, for example, was a challenge for classifying uh, time series and AGN, active galactic nuclei challenges on deck, and a few others will come. So our main goal is science preparation. We provide expert advice to Rubin um, and analysis to Rubin when needed. So we're in close communication with Rubin and Rubin uses the science collaboration as a source of expertise. We fundraise for our own team because we are not NSF or DOE funded with the exception of DESC that receives uh, funds from DOE, Department of Energy. Um, we work closely with the corporation for this fundraising that supports things like our meetings. We train, we educate, and we engage the scientific community in the, um, in the Rubin Observatory preparation. So the science collaboration members enjoy and benefit from a supportive and collaborative environment that places them in the best position to generate science with Rubin data. I want to spend one more second to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We aspire to be an inclusive, equitable uh, environment, and we're working with Renew Vigor in the wake of recent events that expose inequity and racism in society and in science 
to turn this aspiration into action. We are creating a council for diversity, equity, and inclusion of the science collaboration that will work with other similar initiatives at Rubin um, and in larger, um, in larger agencies. Uh, we have individual science collaboration initiatives, such for, as, for example, a call to action of TDS, and you generally can find those on the website of each science collaboration. We'll have a Wednesday plenary session on the science collaboration. There's a Slack channel. You can ask questions there if you want more details about the science collaborations. And I'm gonna leave you with this slide that has links to the website of each science collaboration. Those links are also on the plenary website. Um, and I encourage you to contact us. Uh, member people, I told you why you should become a member of a science collaboration. I didn't tell you how. Each science collaboration has a slightly different uh, application process, but all the information can be found on the website of each science collaborations. Uh, US and Chilean scientists can uh, apply and generally uh, at this time international members can also apply. We have ways of including them in the science collaborations um, for the time being as observers uh, until in-kind contributions are finalized and relationship between international communities and Rubin are finalized. I think I'm done, Melissa. Wonderful. Thank you, Fed. And thanks to all, all of our speakers today. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm going to sort of let everyone go now if you do have to go. Um, but also, um, so if you do have to go, you can go continue our conversations in the Slack channel. Uh, so if you have follow-up questions um, at all, please just post them there and we'll get them answered there. And um, yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna bring up one question from the Zoom chat. Oh, the Fed just answered. Great, never mind. Right. So the question I can answer it quickly. The question was if you have to be a member of a research team or university to be in a science collaboration. The answer is no. Keeping in mind that the science collaboration are not uh, the public outreach environment. They're not we, the ETO, right? So we're designed to be um, a community of people that are involved in STEM and that will do scientific analysis of the data, but definitely you don't have, it doesn't require any kind of affiliation to participate. Awesome. Okay, thanks everyone. I hope you have a great project and community workshop and that this was helpful for you. And uh, yeah, talk to you on Slack some more. Bye. Thanks all.